All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 124th episode of The Get Down, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name is Kareem, and we have someone other than Gary W. here with us today. Introduce yourself, please. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that didn't work. There it goes. There it is. Back to me. <laughs> we got Studio Ferrari Menace with us Ferrari. today. <laughs> taking over the co-host chair. Taking uh, over the man. co-host chair. I love when I get the text from you guys to be on this podcast. One of my <laughs> highlights of the month. <laughs> I feel like we work together so much already uh, with, you know, the DJs and the artists and just kind of like, just as a team here in New Jersey, it only makes sense for us to bring this to uh, to the podcast and to the listeners. So Yeah, man, I, I love, I mean, in my spare time, I and a lot of got my guys know also that I don't listen to music as much anymore because I'm around music so, so much more than the average person that like, when I'm driving in the car, I listen to my podcasts, and this is one of them. So being a part of it is a lot of fun. So <laughs> I like to I like to spread the wealth, spread the knowledge. So I don't know anyone who follows Mikey uh, may have may may have or may have not seen that he was in Vegas for his birthday last week, and what turned out to be I'm sure a great time <laughs> quickly <laughs> quickly turned into disaster. So what happened? Well, let's start off by blaming United Airlines. What a mess. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, wife and I go to Vegas, 30th birthday. We obviously have some friends in Vegas that uh, we want to see as well. So it was more of like a like a non-DJ Vegas trip, if you would, right? I've really only been to Vegas uh, to party. Um, so my wife and I went, which was a very different experience than, uh, you know, my usual Vegas trips. And, you know, it was more dinner, shows, relaxing. Um Although I did uh, sneak out of the hotel room at 11 p.m. on Friday to go see my boy DJ Flight at Zook. Um, he was opening for Tiesto, and then it turned out that you know we were just in the booth hanging out with Tiesto, drinking tequila with Tiesto. Very, very cool experience. He played a couple of records that um, you know weren't out that I've, I've known of, of and worked on a little bit. And uh, next thing you know, 3 a.m. comes around, and I'm doing a back-to-back with DJ Flight in the <laughs> Zook. I'm absolutely twisted for my 30th birthday. So if you ever see me that twisted, guys, never put me on as a back-to-back. But yeah, um, you know, I, I got stuck. Uh, one, I, I guess we were supposed to leave Sunday. Um, one canceled flight turned into six canceled flights, long story short. There were no flights going into the Northeast. I've tried Boston. And I think the funniest part about this, before I get into all the cities, is that you know, I travel a lot, uh, especially for work and DJing. And, you know, I put on my Instagram story, I'm stuck in Vegas. And I had people like DMing me saying like, did you look at another airport? Like, of course I did. Like, did you think <laughs> about driving? Yeah, of course I thought about driving. But it was like such a stickier situation that could have been because my wife had to work. So like, I didn't want her taking calls like in the middle of Oklahoma, wherever we were driving. Um, you know, and, and, and of course it's the only time I brought my DJ laptop and I didn't bring my producer laptop. So I am so backed up in the studio now. You have no idea. And I felt bad for all my students because I canceled every single lesson with them. I didn't get home until Friday at 3 AM. Um, I had to push back my house music course again, another week. So thankfully that started this week. Um, but it was just a nightmare, man. And uh, I don't want to even give a shout out to United Airlines because the way they handled it was horrible. <laughs> they owe me a lot of money and a lot of time. So, well, we're we're glad that you're back. And uh, you know, short week plus all the travel. We we know. I, I just appreciate you setting some time for us here. So thank you. Of course, yeah. Any any so, time to be on the podcast. <laughs> we, you know, we've been working. I I just put out uh, closer, which came out last week. If you guys haven't checked it out, you can check it out on any streaming platform. You can go check it out on SoundCloud. Download it for free. Oh yeah. Uh, but Mikey was a big part of helping me put this record out. So I thought it would be a really cool kind of conversation to, to just go through a little bit of what really goes into creating a song and all the work behind the scenes and really break it down kind of into three separate areas. So first and foremost, like the idea and the actual creation of the track, uh, and then talking a little bit about the mixing and mastering to make it sound as, as great as it can possibly sound. And then the last part, which I... I've been kind of learning and going through on the fly is really a promotion part and really coming up with a really strong plan uh, to not only, you know, put out the track, but then be able to get people to hear the track and play the track and download the track. So um, let, let's start with the idea creation and, and the first part of, of this whole process. And the first question I would ask you is just kind of 
how do you get a inspiration and how do you come up with ideas for songs? And as DJs or editors that are making maybe, you know, not necessarily originals or remix, how could they be thinking about creating originals or more original production? Man, that's such a tough question because it, it really does vary from track to track. I mean, I've started tracks with you know, just trying to uh, recreate a drum loop from another track and then it turns into a song. I've started tracks with trying to, you know, uh, create a lead sound. But, I mean, it all you have to draw inspiration from everywhere. I mean, I'm inspired by so many things, and I think that, you know, if you've ever been to my studio, like this space now um, really, like, shows a lot of things I'm inspired by. I mean, for me, if you know me, I love sneakers. I love fashion. I love design. I love all that stuff. And that's kind of like where this studio came in was, you know, I have stuff from Virgil Abloh here. I have all of his books on the coffee table. Sometimes if I like I'm drinking my coffee, I'll open up the books and I'll look at like, you know, his workflow process. But you could be inspired by so many things. But, you know, I think the biggest thing now is and it's always been for me being a DJ first was how what what is missing in my sets right like if i look at my dj set and i'm like okay this i i like this song but there's not a version that i would play should i make a version of this right and i think that's always kind of been my theme and i think the the one that really stuck out for me was uh seven nation army i remember i was preparing for one of my sets at electric adventure back in 2014 and I wanted to play Seven Nation Army, but there were no edits or remixes really out there. So I, I was, you know, really big on that Melbourne Bounce sound. And I said, you know, let me make a big Melbourne Bounce remix of this song. And, you know, I started with, you know, the, the typical Seven Nation Army bass guitar. Um, I actually sampled a crowd uh, like I played in the beginning, but it was actually a football stadium crowd that went, oh, oh, oh. And I, you know, timed it and put it on uh, with the bass nice. line. And, you know, I came up with these big super sauce synths that was big in my big room sound. And, you know, next thing you know, I was sitting at my kitchen table. I had the, the full track done, and it fit perfectly in my set. It blended with everything else around it that I was playing at the time. And, you know, it, and it's probably one of the most played Seven Nation Army remixes still today. Uh, it was under Mikey P. If you guys want to look it up, it's somewhere on the internet. Um, but, yeah, Seven Nation Army Mikey P remix. It's, it's just one of those things that I used to fill in the gaps in my sets, and I'm still doing that today. Yeah, I would second you on that note where a lot of the ideas will come from stuff that happens while DJing, you know? Yeah. It's not as much driving in the car or listening to music, but I guess that's because we, you know, you not as much anymore, but we were both DJing and gigging, you know, a lot. And it's, yeah. it's like you see the reactions to certain songs, and I think the next track that I'm working on, uh, the idea basically came to me because every time I would play the original song in an open format set, it, w it always goes off. And right. I went to go look for a remix of that song to play in my house sets, and I couldn't find one. I'm like, okay, well, this is the next remix that I want to make because there's a gap in the market, and there's a gap that I can fill in my sets that I think is going to work, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I've been doing that since I was creating edits as well. Yeah, I think that if you can create a blend 50-50 kind of um, of like – or maybe let's call it – 60 40 60 percent of you right where it's it's this is what you want to create this is your sound this is what you're inspired by and then like 40 percent of what's kind of trending and popular uh with elements of it i think that you're well on your way to success right like i i, I take a look at like what hardwell um kind of did with big room like you know how many times have we heard the big room kick with the big super sauce since or whatever it kind of got a little bit drawn out so when hardwell came out with his new sound you know, Tech House and Techno was kind of coming to the forefront, and he said, let me just combine my big room synths and energy with the Techno stuff. And, uh, you know, that stuff has been going off. I, I don't think a lot of people understood it at first, and I think this has, like, kind of been, like, a theme. I remember when before we had the Discord chat for Get Down, we had the WhatsApp group, and I remember, uh, I think it was Hova was, like, Oh, you know, Hardwell set sucked, and and I made like a Will Smith meme, like where he was like slapping uh, what's his face, and I put like <laughs> Ferrari me as Will Smith, and then I put uh, was it Chris Rock or Chris Tucker? I forget who it was. Uh, and yeah, then it was like uh, all the the Hardwell um uh like haters, and those like ho or get down artists hating on Hardwell set. But then you know <laughs> this year like Hova was like, oh my god, it was one of the best sets. And I'm like, well, because you get it now, right? Like. Right. It, it, with original stuff, it takes, and this is where I really credit you because I think you've strictly done original stuff with me, but original stuff, like it's hard because you're creating something that people maybe haven't heard before or like are not, I guess, attracted to at first where like the remixes, they always have that element of familiarity in it, right? Whether it's 
the vocal or like the chord progression or whatever it may be, it draws more people to it, which is generally why the remixes do better. But to create original music, especially dance music, which is by far probably one of the hardest genres to create, it's tough. It's really tough to stand out and be original. And that's why I credit you. I think both three tracks we've done so far have all been originals. Yeah. Yeah. We had, Three we of had, them. That's, that's we had closer. To make it hot with her just back. cream, yeah. and then and then me and Angelo did the incredible. Yeah, exactly. And I think, and I don't think you even know this, but I I was actually going through the support list for uh, a couple of the guys, and I stumbled on a Headliner Music Club track list uh, from mm-hmm. Fade University with Five and Eric Deluxe, like about a year ago, and they played closer, which I was like, oh my god, I didn't even realize that, you know? Yeah, so I it's I didn't either. Yeah. So it's pretty cool, like, you know, um, you never know when the song's going to hit or when someone's going to discover it or play it. And I think that's the coolest thing. And I don't remember if it was, is it Kurt Cobain who has the most, po- is it post-death, posthumous royalty collections? Like, I've always wanted to leave a legacy like that where, like, after I leave the earth, like, people are still, like, my, my footprint is still in the earth, right? Like, with your music. And I think that's such a cool thing to think about when you're creating music you know yeah i mean you're you have your fingerprints on a lot of stuff whether your name is on it or not like even even with my track right so we we brought how mikey and i've worked a lot in in the past and especially on this release was i'd work on stuff at home right i come up with some ideas this particular track i had a terrible like self vocal that i put on there just to like take up space and i bring you the track and i'm like hey this is my idea this is where it is right now this is where i want to get it to you know, maybe this is a certain sound that I'm trying to achieve or I'm trying to create this element and I don't know how to do it. How do we do it? Uh, and and it's been really great to work with you in that way where maybe I don't know how to do something, create a particular sound or riser or something we want to put in the track. And you could, I can like hum it to you or, or tell you what I'm trying to do and we can create it right there. And that's been really amazing because the amount of time that it would take me to sit at home and watch videos on YouTube to try to figure out how to create that one element of the track is done in, you know, 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. I think that also, like, a lot of people think that, you know, because I guess a lot of the new guys think that the school is, uh, it's it's school and we're teaching stuff, but really why the one-on-ones are so special, like you and I work on, is because, you know, I am able to, like, dive into your track and say, okay, this is the direction I got to take it. Because the hardest thing, I think, as a new producer, especially for me, was... I have so many projects like from back in like t- like 2011, 2012, 2013 when I first started producing. I have over like 50, 60 projects and they're all like build ups and drops or breakdowns and drops, but they they went to like the the producer graveyard I call it from there because the hardest thing is finishing a track. And that's where a lot of you guys get caught is like you have these ideas, you have a lot of these good ingredients because it's so g- easy to get good ingredients now with Splice or, you know, the internet and YouTube and all that. But then it's like how do I put them together and put this out as a dish to serve for the world, right? And I think that's where, you know, my expertise kind of comes in and I say, "Okay, well I I see where you have it and I almost kind of A&R it." You know, like as like a record A and R, a record label A and R, and say, hey, you know, this is the kind of stuff that labels are looking for now. This is the kind of stuff that's working. Why don't you take it towards this direction? It still sounds like you because all of this stuff is original. And let's take it towards this way. Whether we take a reference track and maybe use the arrangement of that, or we use that reference track to steal some of the sounds, or or whatever it may be, um, and just kind of get it towards the end goal. And I think the end goal is 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 really where a lot of my students find the benefit in myself because I'm able to help them finish it and then do all the other things that we we're going to talk about in a second, like the mixing and mastering and, you know, the promotion. And I think that's some of the stuff that a lot of guys don't really, um, you know, take into account a lot of the times is, is, is the finishing aspect. Yeah. Until you really go through it. I, I was saying this, you know, I was talking to Angela uh, last week and release week, there's always a ton of work to do. And, you know, I'm like, dude, like, it's just a lot of work, you know, like it's release week. We have so much, stuff. I have so much stuff that I need to focus on just for the track that comes out on Friday. And it's like, you don't even doing it twice before I forgot, you know, <laughs> yeah. like I, I mean, forgot I give how out much the, time I give out that checklist, if you remember, right? Like yep. I give out a checklist and actually it was, it's an idea I took from, I believe it was Smash the House uh, when they sent me a uh, release plan because every major label follows a release plan, right? Um, so spin in, uh, you know, revealed, uh, mix smash, smash the house, all the labels I've worked on, they always have a release plan put in store and they have certain tasks that have to get done on certain days. Right. So this release checklist I came out with is just a Friday 
release checklist, just the things you have to achieve on your actual Friday release day, uh, whether it's scheduling the download gate, making sure all your assets are ready, uploading the uh, track or the canvas to Spotify, um, making that your artist pick on Spotify, uh, changing the links in your bio, all these little things that you're like, always going to do, but you'll forget it like sometimes. So I made that checklist to kind of just make sure that like, okay, do this, check, move on to the next one, do this, check. And it really streamlined the process and makes it a lot, I guess, easier for you guys. Well, I hope it did because yeah. otherwise uh, I wouldn't be doing my job. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much and you know that you would know from experience. How long does that usually take you? Like an hour, hour and a half, two hours sometimes on yeah. the release day? For sure. Yeah. For sure. So we'll we'll get more into that part of it. I think the, a big chunk of this conversation will be more about the checklist and some of the stuff on the back end because I think it relates really well to anyone that's creating anything, whether it's a mix, whether it's you know edits or edit packs. Like I think that part of the conversation, if you guys aren't making original music, you can take what we talk about and use it in your own in your own business. Going back to the creation and and uh, you know coming up with the idea and stuff. I think um, something that's really, really helpful if you're a, a, a aspiring producer or you're creating edits and you want to get into uh, the remix game or the original game, I think having – you mentioned reference track. Having a reference track of an artist or song that you think sounds amazing or you really like the elements or you really like the arrangement and using that track to kind of help map out your sounds – you know, you can, you can sit there and listen to a drop and pull out all the different sounds or the elements of their track and find your own sounds to create your drop, you know, or to create your buildup. And I think that was really helpful when I first started to, to really listen to that reference track. And it helped me understand how many elements go into a track and also where they sit in the mix many times. Yeah. So use those reference tracks. I think that was such a huge, huge part of it. And then the other thing is like you have to have splice and you have to go dig in splice and get inspiration from sounds or loops or things that are, are going on there. Yeah. I mean the first lesson I give every student, including you, that joins the academy is a scaffolding lesson, right, where I teach them the art of being creative and some principles about being creative. But most importantly, uh, we, we talk about scaffolds, right? And, and again, if, if you're a student of mine, you've probably heard this all over again, but a scaffold, you know, we're, we're from New York City. And so when we walk around New York, we see a scaffold. And I always ask everybody, what does that scaffold do, right? That scaffold helps builders support the building to do the work. And then once they don't need it anymore and the building has support, you take it away. It's exactly what we do when we're looking at a blank slate and we're trying to create something, right? And I wouldn't even settle for one reference track. I would throw two, three. Maybe you like the breakdown of one track. Maybe you like the uh, drums of another track, right? That's kind of how you're getting ideas. You're drawing inspiration from all these different places. And I think when it comes to me, again, the best example I use is like uh, – Kanye West's shoe, the the foam runner. I think we've talked about this before, but that foam runner shoe, like I remember like when I posted that shoe on my Instagram, everybody was like, yo, throw that shoe out. That's the ugliest shoe. Like more people came out of the woodwork to tell me that that shoe was the ugliest thing they've seen. <laughs> like more people than congratulated me on my wedding, right? And that shoe looks like something already. That shoe is just an inspiration of something that's already out there, which is so important because it's been coming back into fashion, which is the croc, right? So that's Kanye's version of a croc. It's like the same materials. It's the same as holes in it, just like a croc, right? But why is that one seemed so new, right? Well, Kanye just drew inspiration from his color palette, his earth color palette. He uh, he took the, the inspiration from the croc and the holes. And that's what you're essentially doing when you're making a song, right? You're, you're taking all the things that inspire you, whether it's the breakdown from that track, the drums from this track, the sound design of another track. And I like to put them into Ableton and... Just try and, you know, pick a kick that sounds similar to that one or pick a lead sound that sounds similar to this one. And, you know, next thing you know, you're combining ideas from two or three things that you're inspired by and you create something completely original, right? And, you, you know, you made also another good put on, or point on Splice, but, you know, hunting on Splice is also something that you should really make a – priority or like a uh some, something in your like your daily producer pattern weekly because splice is constantly coming out with new sounds and i think being a producer is you know finding the newest sounds and making them work and just like you guys dig for records like uh, how many how, how much do you dig for records now i'm just curious i don't dj as much anymore and i play much of the older stuff but what's your record digging process like my i'm digging for records weekly i'm preparing for sets weekly 
And I have a set period of time every week that I spend dedicated to doing that. So, you know, that should be the same process, but doing it for samples, right? You should be digging through hundreds of these sample packs and companies and finding the companies that you like, finding the companies that you don't like, finding the sounds that you like. And then what I do is I uh, I download all the ones I like Monday and then I organize them into a folder, right? So I'll have like, I, I kind of create my own sample pack, but I have a folder called Perari Samples 2013 or 2023, right? And I'll put like five of my favorite kicks in there. Uh, you know, 40 of my favorite snares, claps and hats or whatever it may be, right? And then when I'm creating a track, I'm using stuff that I already know is already hand selected by me. It has my taste, right? And, you know, I'm not starting a track and picking a new kick drum every single time. My last four releases have had the same kick drum, hi hat, and clap in every single track. Why? Because I know they work, right? And it sounds like me, and the way I process them is mine. So, you know, that's another big thing that you guys could do to, you know, kind of keep you along and, and also help you find your sound, your quote unquote yeah. sound. Because I know you, all three of your records, they sound like you, which is amazing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think coming in, I kind of know what I want to sound like. You know, a lot of people maybe don't know that yet or are trying to find that. And, you know, I'm still I'm still narrowing that down and kind of adjusting and every record's going to sound a little different. But, yeah, I mean, I think what you said also about creating those those folders, you know, this goes for editors too, right? Like if I'm creating clap intros or I need to add a kick somewhere, I'm pulling from those same files. You know, it's not just people that are making remixes originals. So, you know, creating those those cream packs or whatever your name is, creating your own pack of sounds is going to help you no matter what level or where you are as a producer. Definitely. I mean, I had a, I had a Crook and Clan folder. It's still on my desktop from when I was on Crack for DJs and Crook and Clan. Uh, this is before this whole editing craze happened. This is like 10 years ago, 20, not maybe longer, 12 years ago, 2011, 2010, when I first got started getting into DJing. And I still have the Lil John Clapapellas, uh, you know, put your hands up. Like, and they <laughs> yeah, still work today, which is amazing. <laughs> but I still have all those organized from when I was an editor, you know. Um, I haven't dove into that folder in a while. Like, sometimes I'll pull from that for, you know, making my own DJ edits or intros or whatever I want to do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely important to stay organized like that when it comes to your sample selection and, and stuff. And it's only going to make you a better producer, um, editor, whatever it may be. Yeah. I think the last point that I want to make on working on original music is, guys, it's it's hard, right? It's really hard. And I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed and to get frustrated. And I, I want to just talk a little bit about ways to get past that because that's a struggle that I've I've had in my production career where I start to work on something and maybe it's just not moving along as quickly as I want it to move along. So can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some strategies to kind of get past that? Yeah, because to be honest with you, I struggled with this a lot because I don't find myself musically talented. I don't, I don't well, I mean, I guess people would, you know, beg to differ with that, but um I I don't come from a family of music geniuses, I, I which is different from you, you know, your your father was a musician, but um you know, I don't have any musical talents or talented people in my family like um, I just kind of just always practice the the hard work method. And I think that if you work hard at anything, you'll be good at it. And it, it just goes to show where someone like me who doesn't really have that many musical talents can, you know, make music and, and, and achieve this stuff. But there's always three things that I kind of did, um, when it came to writer's block, um, and it kind of helped me progress in a, in a more positive way, because I always say there's something that you could be doing when you're making music that it doesn't have to be actually making music, but there's other things that you could do that could be making yourself better. So the first thing that I always do is um, I refresh my sample library, always, right? If I'm creating music for like a period of three months and I'm using the same sounds and I'm not being inspired by them, usually what I do is I take a break and I'll take a day or two, right? And then I'll come back to it and I'll refresh everything, whether it's downloading a new synth or a new pack for a synth or or new samples. And I do a complete refresh and I try and make songs out of them, right? Um, that has always helped me kind of like come up with new ideas or break through. Anything that has to do with refreshing your sounds could be one of the things that you could do. Um, the second thing that I would do is I would uh, try and teach myself a new skill, right? Whether it was 
um, you know, playing the piano, right? So instead of, you know, the, the piano is basically what we make all of our stuff on when we're producing. So uh, I would try and teach myself piano or music theory or chords, whether I was on YouTube watching a guy teach a two-year-old how to play the piano and do chords and stuff like that. Anything that you could do to help better yourself and create ideas faster would be a super, super, super good idea. And then the third thing that I would do um, I would take a track that I really like and I would just strictly try and remake it, right? Um, whether it was the arrangement or just picking the drum sounds and I would really focus in because it wasn't my track that I was creating, right? I was just trying to recreate one of my favorite tracks. Um, arrangement, sound design. Maybe if I didn't know how to make this sound, I'd go on YouTube and look it up. And next thing you know, you have something like a skeleton almost of something that sounds very similar to what you want to do. And most times I would take that and turn it into you know, maybe an original or a remix or something like that. So there are so many other things that you could do without having to actually sit down there and say, listen, I'm going to go ahead and make my own track right now, right? Yeah. So all the other little things to help better yourself could really, really help get past that writer's block. And, you know, the other thing that you could do, I guess I should have mentioned this first and foremost, is take a break. Take a break and take some time to get away from the computer and step away and refresh your palate and, you know, go do other things that isn't music. And I promise when you come back, it'll be fresh again um, when you want to make a song. Being a creative and, and having to sit down and, and create something, it's it's hard sometimes, right? Sometimes you sit down and you're like, wow, I'm like knocking this out. I'm, I'm, I just finished, you know for me as an editor, right? I just finished three edits in one sitting, which I never usually do. Like I was really feeling it. The ideas were flowing. My workflow, I was moving, you know, quickly and thoroughly. And then there's some days I sit down and I try to start three projects and like nothing happens. And I'm like, all right, well, I, I don't got it today. You know, like I just don't got it today. It's the way it, it's the way it I is. Close, I close Ableton and I'm like, we live to fight another day and that's right. it. I think it's tough too, because I think a lot of my guys like expect me to be creative all the time. Like I'm this machine, you know, like, I'll go into a lesson and someone will be like, yo, I want to make a lead like, you know, Cheyenne Giles. And I'm like, well, I'm not Cheyenne Giles. I yeah. don't know how to make, I could help you get close to it, but I don't know if that's going to be like in an hour, boom, boom, boom. I'm going to help them make, like show them how to make it. Or if I'm like playing with presets for an hour and I'm like, guys, I can't, uh, it's not, it's not happening today, you know? Yeah. So it, it's tough. And, and, and for me, it's, it's, you know, all about, how can I stay the most creative the longest period of time? And and again, it, it, some, some weeks it's tough. So, like I needed a break like I did last week in Vegas. It was too long of a break, but I needed that. And then there's some other times where, you know, there's weeks where I'm just boom, and I'm, I'm on it and I'm helping everybody. But it's it's a come and go thing for me. And that's, that's a tough thing with it, with anything creative. That was definitely something that I had to learn, you know, because yeah. I'm very regimented where it's like, all right, well, for the first two hours today, I'm going to work on this. And a lot of times, like, for the first two hours today, I'm going to work on production. And, and, like, it just doesn't happen sometimes. It's a hit or, or miss. Or sometimes it goes into three hours because I'm like, wow, I'm really flowing. I got to just keep it going. Yeah. I think I think for me, the, the, the studio breakup part of the day where I leave the studio and I go do something else really helps because I know some guys that just work from, like, 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. to like, you know, 9 p.m. and they don't take any breaks. But for me, the, the biggest thing is like taking the break, whether it's for lunch. Well, I take two breaks, I would say. I take my break for lunch and then I take my break to go to the gym. And the gym really helps me, clears yeah. my mind. I don't have to listen to all the time, right? Like I, I put on something else, whether it's a podcast or something. And then when I come back, I'm usually so much more clear headed. But the breaks are so important for me. I don't yeah. know what I would do without breaks. And it's everybody does it. And and it was so cool. You know, Vegas, I was stuck, but it ended up working out in my favor because um, you know, my wife and I by day three stuck in Vegas, she was like, I can't eat at the restaurants anymore. So we went to Whole Foods to go grab, you know, um, lunch. Uh, I think it was just like lunch and dinner stuff or whatever. And, you know, one of my mentors, his name is Luca Predalesi. He's a mixing and mastering engineer out of Las Vegas. He owns a studio called Studio DMI. Um, he also did the mixing and mastering for the Skrillex album and the Drake album. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm checking out at Whole Foods and, and I'm, I'm just like about to leave. And, you know, the part of Whole Foods, like by the registers where you can sit and like eat lunch and stuff. Yeah. I picked my head up and Luca was sitting right there. <laughs> and it was funny because we were talking on Instagram. We follow each other on Instagram. And uh, he was like, he was laughing about how I was stuck in Vegas and all that stuff. And, you know, it was so cool that I kind of just like got to meet him right there. And guess what he was doing? He was taking a studio break 
eating at Whole Foods just to get out of the studio while mixing the new Skrillex album. And I was <laughs> like, that's so cool. Everybody still does this, you know? And we had a great chat, and it was awesome to finally meet him in person. But, uh, you know, it's something that everybody does. And it's something that a lot of people don't do is take a break. Take yeah. a little break. <laughs> I think that's good advice for anything, you know, anything we're doing. If you're struggling in whatever, if you're booking gigs and you're sitting here like, I've been doing this for two hours, I can't do it anymore. You got to take a little break. It helps. Definitely. All right, so let's move on to the next portion of kind of the, the, the three things I talked about here. So we talked about the idea creation and coming up with an idea and creating it. Let's talk a little bit about once we've completed the track, right, like the raw track, and we're going to make it, we're going to mix it, and we're going to master it. And, and explain what those two things are and why they're so important. Yeah, well, I treat mixing and mastering as one process, to be honest with you. I, I always treat my master as an extension of my mix. But if you guys don't know, basically what the mixing and mastering process is, is it's taking a producer's song and basically um, making it sound ready for the radio, the club, whatever you guys have, whatever goals you, you plan on doing with this song, right? Um, and kind of finishing it off. And And I always feel like you could squeeze another 15 10 percent out of the song uh with the mix and master now it's not that important to be quite honest with you i know a ton of producers who, who make amazing ideas and there are not great mixing and mastering engineers but their songs still get played out everywhere and it's because the ideas are good but uh i i've always liked the mixing and mastering process and i feel like it's so important because there is a whole industry and world out there for sound engineering and mixing and mastering that you guys could kind of dive into but uh for closer it was really cool because um you know it was more i guess the closer is more focused on the drums and the um, the baseline aspect of it with the vocal. And I think that was one of the biggest struggles we had was trying to have the drums present, the vocal present, and making it sound the way it did while not interfering with the baseline and other parts of the track. And I think that uh, the process that we use that I like to use, which is called stem mixing, really, really helps. Um, basically, it's it's when you, you take your groups – uh, whether it's the kicks, the drums, the the bass lines, the, uh, the synths or whatever, and you bounce them to audio. Um, and the reason why I like to do that is because you could start a brand new project um, free of CPU and get the most uh, bang for your buck when it comes to the plugins because you could take advantage of things like oversampling, linear phase mode, stuff like that, which will, again, make your, your song a little bit more um, – uh, higher quality. Uh, and then also, uh, you're able to commit to that production process. Cause what a lot of guys do is they'll, they'll start the mixing and mastering process and they'll say, Oh, well, I can't get my kick to sound good. So I'm going to change the kick and I'm going to do this. And they fall into this endless spiral, dark hole of changing the track when we're, you know, trying to finish the track. So right. the, the bouncing of the stems really commits you to what you have and taking it to the next level. I think that's a great part of the, the process is making that commitment, right? Because I think all of us, it, it takes a long time to do this, right? To finish the, the, the project. So committing and saying, all right, this is done. Like, I'm not changing that stuff. I think that's a big thing. It's like a weight off your shoulders, you know, because yeah. I'm not thinking about, oh, I don't necessarily like the way this sounds. I'm going to go change it. It's just a matter of making whatever we've committed to sound as good as possible. Right. And, you know, that's something that, like, I've always struggled with because I'm a perfectionist, and I'll change it until it sounds the best. But you ha there comes a point where you have to get to it and say, okay, I'm done. This is the best I can get it. And I think that's what separates a decent producer from a really good producer is that you have to know when you can't do more than you've already done. Like, you know, one of the biggest things that I like to do at the end of a songwriting process is take away things. What did I add too much of? And most guys will just add more, more, more. But no, yeah. it's kind of taking away and stripping it back and making sure that the idea of the song still sounds good by itself. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the stem process is so good because it lets you finalize, like you said. And I think another good thing about having the stems done is that when you want to go start your next track you have your own like for example your own scaffolding. stem yeah <laughs> that you could throw into the track and you know you could use that right off the bat like whether it's risers or uplifters and continue to recycle and reuse that stuff um and it really makes it a lot faster to create songs and it makes it sound like you which is awesome so one other thing too that i want to bring up that i i really in this particular track uh, when we were creating the song before we got to the mixing and mastering part, you know, you want to make the song sound as good as possible in that initial process. You don't want to rely on the mix and master to make it quote unquote sound better, right? Yeah, or fix no. things. So I think the goal is not having to do a whole lot of mastering on the track because in the, pro in the creative process, you've, 
made it a, a song that sounds really good to begin with. There's there's this like myth, this music production myth that's again been around forever, which is like somebody will send me a track and they'll say, "Oh, well, it doesn't sound that good because it's not mastered." The master, like all it's doing, is making it louder. Do some stereo imaging, more polished. It's that last one percent, and the biggest thing in the music industry that everybody talks about is you can't polish a turd, right? If your mix sucks, your master's gonna suck, right? So it's basically not the master that sucks; it's your mis- mixing that sucks. And I feel like you know it's something that's so under or overlooked the mixing because if you can make it sound good, like there's not really much you have to do. And I think that's where closer really like stood out for me is that you know the samples and stuff that you picked were already so good that you didn't even have to do a lot of mixing number one number two the master was just kind of making it louder more compressed and tighter which was awesome so um it it, it all goes back to like being a chef right and and i use this example i like to use a lot of real world examples with my guys but you know a chef we we talk about a chef and and he's got to get ingredients from somewhere right um It's a lot harder to take bad ingredients and doctor them up to make them taste good than to just use good ingredients, quality ingredients in the beginning, and there's not much you have to do to make them taste good, right? So it's the same thing with music production. So if you're using those good samples and you're using those good ingredients, there's not much you have to do in the end, right? So just start with good sources, good ingredients. Yeah, I think we really focused our mastering process on the vocal, right? Because the vocal we used, it had it was it was kind of uh, processed a little bit already. So a lot of what we tried to do was just kind of brighten that vocal so it shone through a little more and it popped yeah. through the mix a little more. And that was like the, the focus, I think, for us on on this track. Yeah, and we you know we kind of went over that. Um, I think we used that plugin track spacer. It's a plugin that I've been using forever, which is uh, it's just there's other plugins that do it, but it's a it's basically a sidechain plugin. And when people think about sidechain, they think about the kick in the bass, right? Where the the, the bass is ducking uh, when the kick plays. But sidechain could also be used for space, and that's where this track spacer came in. So I think what we did was when the vocal was sitting in the frequencies of the synths. We put the track spacer on the synths, and we said, okay, every time the vocal plays, it's going to do the inverse EQ of the vocal. So it took the vocal EQ, right, and it took the inverse of that, and it ducked the synths uh, in the exact inverse of the vocal a little bit, which is like some crazy professor (laughs) shit, I know. Everyone's like, oh, what what is he talking about? But it made the vocal stand out more because it it took the frequencies and ducked them away so that the vocal could make room because the vocal in Closer is so low and it's, and our, I think our like synths in that track were like very low pads and re-spaces. So that was one of the coolest things that we did and it really shined through the mix and made it, uh, you know, easier for the ear to pick it up on. So Yeah, for sure. I think this portion of this part of creating a song, I'm still like very, very green on. It's like the 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 mix part and creating the song, like that's one thing. But the mastering, it's like a whole other. It's a whole other world. And we, you know, a lot of our our time together, you're really like helping me learn more about the mastering part. And I'm excited to on the next release spend more time there because I think in this in this particular track, you you know you you did all that <laughs> like. So well, yeah, I and, 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 and you know what, but next, it's cool because one. you have that relationship now where you, you watch the process. For me, I never had that mentor somebody when I was learning this to kind of like watch until I met Luca, to be honest with you, where I, you know, I was figuring it out all on my own, but there were still things that were very gray and, and I knew how to make dance music good, but it didn't apply. I didn't know my tools, basically. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I, I knew how to make dance music good because I watched this guy do it, but I didn't know my tools. And now I kind of know how to do it for all aspects of music. Uh, thanks to Luca, to be honest with you. And, um, I I, enjoy, I really enjoy that part. For me, it's it's like the 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 puzzle part of how can I make it sound the best with all these little micro decisions and doing all these little cool tricks. Um, again, guys, it's not necessary to know this, but I think if you can have a mentor to show you the process, so you could watch how it's done and see how it's done in real time with your music specifically. Um, it really, really helps because most of the YouTube videos I used to watch was always like, if you want to learn compression, I was watching a guy like use like an LA-2A or an 1176 on a rock guitar. And I'm like, well, I'm not really using a lot of rock yeah. guitars in my music. So, yeah. All right. So let's move on to the third part of kind of putting out the track. And that's the promotion side of it. And this is an area that I'm, I'm pretty confident in my skills. Uh, over the years, I've used marketing promotion to really help grow my brand a lot from the from the time I first started DJing. So I know how important this is and how much it could help you. And, you know, you talked about that uh, release checklist, but something you and I did 
during one of our sessions, we literally took a, a blank calendar and we kind of typed out the timeline of all the things that need to get done, when they need to get completed by, and it kind of laid out a week by week basis, right? We did three weeks leading up to the track and then one week after the track and or after releases. And I think we're talking about uh, promoting music, but I think uh, promoting original music here, but I think this can go for anything that you're creating and coming up with this plan and this schedule, it, it just creates like a step-by-step -step of what you need to do to see success or at least set yourself up for success in, in anything that you're doing. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the promo side. I, I want to get into a little bit like how some artists are really – promoting their records and i think it's changed a lot in the last few years but oh, well it's always changing i mean i've seen everyone promote records from you know big or small guys uh in all different types of ways and i think one of the the, the craziest ways i've seen doing it was i call it the, like the avici method and i think kind of like a craze almost did the same thing with that which is like you know, the biggest form of, of promotion for a DJ is DJ promotion, like having DJs play your record. And what those guys did was, and I saw it first with Levels and then with A-Crazes do it to it, but they had so many guys playing the song before it actually came out that when it yeah. finally came out, it was like the biggest explosion of the record I've ever seen in my life, right? Like you saw it with Levels. How many guys were playing out Levels before? Like I think Levels, it came, I, he was playing it a lot like, March of like, I think it was 2011, I want to say, and it didn't come out till October. So it was like six months of like going to see Avicii and hearing it. And it was the same thing with A Craze, but except A Craze wasn't playing shows. You would have to hear it at like DJ Snake, uh, you know, Carnage or, or whoever was playing the record at Everybody the time. Everybody was and playing it, the record. Exactly. And it just <laughs> blew up. So I've seen records, you know, be promoted like that, but also. The traditional method of doing it would be like how we did it, where you have a calendar and tasks had to get done, right? So uh, the first task I always make you guys get done is have all the assets ready because you can't release the song or schedule the song without the assets. For me, that's album artwork, Instagram story artwork, SoundCloud banner, um, it, uh, Spotify canvas, etc. So work with a graphic designer, get all that done stuff done first. Then you could go ahead and you know, put the record out on distro kids, schedule it, whatever you have to do. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing that I always make you guys do is the Spotify promotion, right? So, um, you know, back in 2013, 2014, which is kind of resurging now, but SoundCloud was like the biggest form of record promotion, right? That's where everybody was consuming dance music. But now in like 2023, there's so many different platforms of consuming dance music. There's SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Deezer, all these other things. So I think the biggest one in my opinion is Spotify because I think that's what like I think they pretty much have a, a majority share of the market and one of the things that we did was uh, we we actually did our own research about Spotify playlist finding curators writing down who owns the playlist how to reach out to them um, how many followers have the playlist right um, big big thing because then you could start to develop relationships with playlist curators and you know you never know where that may take you to um so that was one method i think another method that you found a lot of success with was um submit hub right so submit hub's another website where you could actually submit your songs to spotify playlists but not just that to other influencers and curators as well I always see like these TikToks of like people shuffling to songs and stuff like that. Those TikTok influencers are on Submit Hub. So if you want some a TikTok influencer to, you know, with their five million followers to promote your song and shuffle to it, you could submit it to them on Submit Hub. Um, so there's so many different free marketing tools that you could use today to kind of help with your track. Um, but I think having that schedule in place um, is super important because uh, if, if you just kind of go with it blindly, you never know where it's going to go or end up. But if you have that schedule in place and you know and you plan to where it needs to be, it makes your job a lot easier. Yeah. I, the other the other portion of it, you, you know, you had mentioned the uh, Spotify playlist and kind of creating a document or something where that you house all that information, right? Yeah. I think it's the most important thing that you could do in promoting of anything you do as an artist is creating a spreadsheet or document that has all the contact information for all the various DJs, record pools, blogs, all the different places where you could potentially send your music, have a document that has houses all that. Yep. And it, it's going to take you a long time to create this, right? You're, you're going to sit Years. there for hours. Right, right. Years is right. But it, you're going to, when you first initially create this, 
you're going to, you know, a list of all the local DJs, the significant DJs in your market that are playing all the big spot spots, right? You want to create that list and then go find their emails or go submit the music to them on Instagram, right? Yeah. Then you want to find that next tier. Like, here's all the big DJs that are playing all over the country, the guys that are on agencies, the guys that are running the record pools, and you create that list, right? Yep. Then you take it a step further. You go find all the artists that are making music that's similar to your sound and create that list. And those emails are going to be way harder, but you can find stuff, believe me. Yeah, it's like the the tiers, right? I call this my AAA list, my club DJ list, and then just my regular promo list, right? So just like you mentioned, the club DJ list is going to be important because those are all your resident DJs. These are the guys that are playing in all the markets all over the country, whether it's the biggest DJ in St. Louis or the biggest DJ in, you know, uh, Tampa, Florida, you want to, you want to know who those guys are and send them your music and give it to them for free. And it hopes for you to play it because, you know, those are the guys that are playing weekly, uh, you know, five nights a week and that are helping curate your music. So those are going to be your club DJs, which is pretty, uh, you know, if you're a DJ, you could probably find who those guys are. But like you said, the AAA list, that's going to be your big artist. That's kind of a little bit of the harder one to find. Um, and I still have my Excel list growing all the time. It's yeah, growing constantly. And it's name of the artist, method of contact, what, where I've had success contacting them and where they actually listen to my stuff and have they played my stuff before. Because once you open that direct connection and they start playing your stuff, they're going to want more from you, right? So uh, sometimes I've sent stuff to guys and I've get I've maybe seen a play on the SoundCloud um, link from them, but they've never responded to me. They've never maybe played it, but I know they're looking at my stuff. So right, they at least um, listen, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's what makes it worthwhile for at least what for you know all the stuff that I've done. But guys, Instagram DM is a great way right now because uh, everyone's on Instagram. So sometimes just shooting a Dropbox link, uh, which was kind of frowned upon in the past, but just shooting them a link to the song through Instagram DM, it's it's probably better than email right now at this point. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think creating those relationships before you want to send them something is is the best possible way to do Bingo. it. I've, and and that's a lot of times that can just be commenting on their stuff, right? Or maybe you shoot them, maybe they posted something and you shoot them a DM and you say like, wow, I love this track. I'm going to play it. Or you send them a video of you playing the song to this huge reaction or like create that back and forth a little bit before you ask them to do something, which Stole is listen the to your point song. point right out of my mouth. Absolutely. Like, Instagram is so special because you could comment and people will see it. Uh, you could share stuff and people will see it, especially the big DJs. Like I know you and I are on Instagram a ton. Imagine the big DJs. They're constantly on Instagram, DMs or whatever. So if they see this guy constantly tagging them, reposting them, they're going to be more inclined, especially sharing their stuff, like right. their, their music or whatever it may be for free. They're going to be more inclined to listen to what you have to send them to. It just as a thank you, you know, yeah. if they're any sort of decent human being. So, uh, you know, Make sure you guys are doing that before, like, you know, Kareem said, make sure you guys are doing that before you shoot them a DM because, you know, you can't just shoot them a song and, you know, you expect them to ha or listen to it when you've really done nothing for them, you yeah. know? So just those shots in the dark sometimes uh, don't really work as much. What's but. been cool in doing that over the years is sometimes you create a relationship with someone when they're also kind of on the come up or starting out and now they're big artists. <laughs> and Definitely. It's like, now, you know, they're, they're, that relationship is worth a lot more three years later after they've had X amount of releases and have grown than it was when I first met some of these people. So Definitely, definitely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about TikTok because I think this is, this is kind of like something newer in the last few years where artists are getting popular and getting signed and getting big gigs because of their presence on TikTok and some of the strategies there. So... Talk a little bit about that. What are your thoughts and and what are some strategies maybe as as artists ourselves that we can grow on TikTok? Oh, the TikTok machine. I mean, I'm I'm probably one of the worser people to ask about TikTok because I always keep saying, I'm gonna get on TikTok, I'm gonna get a TikTok. And then here I am. I have like no time to actually go ahead and make the TikToks. But I've seen a ton of guys, you know, grow on TikTok and kind of get a lot of big collabs. And I think in dance music, the biggest like TikTok craze that i saw or like the the biggest or the cool story i should say is that uh that guy hypaton i don't know if you've noticed him but he was like the future rave guy and he was kind of like just making future rave remixes and he did the be my lover one and all of a sudden david Guetta reaches out and says hey man i want to collab with you like 
that to me is so amazing. Like the fact yeah. that you could just, you know, be in your bedroom sitting around creating music for fun as a hobby. And then all of a sudden the biggest DJ in the world hits you up and says, I want to put this out with you. And it's probably one of the biggest records out right now. I mean, everybody's playing that in their sets, but TikTok is also like, it, I think it hurts a little bit too, because we haven't seen like a big artist come out this year yet. We haven't seen like a new talent. And I think it's because of this TikTok craze where people are too focused on creating like, I guess, music for TikTok and not for themselves. Um, or like like trying to show what their artistic vision is. They're they're kind of creating for the algorithm is what I'm type of or calling it now. And I think that's kind of hurting the music industry a little bit. So I think that there's gonna be a reset point in a little bit where people are just gonna like, you know, not be creating for TikTok um, and just kind of be creating for themselves. And it, hey, if it goes viral on TikTok, great. But, you know, again, I'm like an indifferent guy about that. I, I kind of see both sides about where TikTok could go and where it needs to be. But I think for promotion, if you can do whatever you have to do to, to, to promote on TikTok, you know, it, it it's only going to help you. It's, it's, it's like that, that saying, right? No press is bad press, right? So if you could get, you know, um, uh, like your song to translate on TikTok, whether it's a viral meme or whatever it could be, it could really, really help your music promotion. But as far as creating for TikTok, again, I don't know if that's something that I would personally be interested in. It's not part of my, uh, you know, goals per se. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say creating for TikTok, but we've seen artists like Disco Lines and oh, Jake Shore sure. Drive use TikTok talk as a way to grow really, really, really quickly. And I, I think that it's a tool in the tool belt, right? It's it's an area that if you're not using it and you're creating, you you need to be putting your stuff there. And I think some people are way better at it than other people. But I, I think traditional, like a lot, we talk in the Discord, right? Our DJs get so mad at these like quick sensations that like blow up there and get yeah. big. But it, guys, this is part of the game, right? Like this is this is what it is in 2023 and if if you're you're not adapting and doing it or or creating for those platforms like you can be a disgruntled artist in discord while these other people are going playing the shows that you want to play so it's like I think like the disgruntlement also comes from not adapting with the times, right? Like I know when I was coming up, like I would see these DJs saying, "Oh, the sync button, the sync button. If you use the sync button, like you're not a real DJ." But like Yeah, there's always something for people to complain about. Yeah, there's always going to be something and maybe I'm turning into that you know, disgruntled guy now. Maybe I don't get what these young guys are doing. I went on a rant the other day and like, you know, the bucket hats and the and the uh, the sunglasses in the club. Like, but again, for me, that's just not being you. That's not being real. Like for me, my artist career is always about being real and showing what I can do and showing myself. And I feel like when you do trends like that, you're just kind of being somebody else. Like, be you. Don't be somebody else, right? And, and you know, we have fishers that do that already, that wear bucket hats and sunglasses. Like, you don't need to do that to fit in. And I think that, you know, these phases, they kind of die out, and then you're left with nothing, right? So, um, like you said, I think that the guys that do excel with TikTok, the disco lines and, like, stuff like that, all power to them. It's not something that I could – maybe do or focus on there's other things i'd like to focus on and that's just me personally i don't want to sit there and dance you know in my bedroom to my original track it's not who i am um but if you can do it take advantage of it and run with it i like it i like it i think one last point i want to just touch on so we self-released this this track right we we didn't even go to any labels we didn't approach anybody i think we talked about it in the studio but things are changing a little bit where it's all right to not have a label. It's all right to just SoundCloud release. So talk a little bit about how things have changed and kind of where you see things going in that regard. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was releasing music back then, the free releases were still great, but I think you kind of needed a label because labels do a lot of things for you, right? They do uh, promotion. They do um, marketing. They do, uh, you know, distribution, right? Uh, it, basically, if you want to get on Beatport or Spotify, you needed a label, right? But now comes DistroKid and Tune, TuneBad or whatever the, the other distribution companies are called, and you don't need to have a label to get on Beatport or any of those platforms now. So um, I think with a 
little bit of a small budget um, and and just a good marketing plan, you could achieve what these you know labels are kind of doing, right? I think that the only thing that maybe they have, which you could potentially get just from being in the industry and doing the work, is the promo list, right? Because they have an extensive promo list of you know the biggest DJs where they could send the the, the promos to them every week and and. It- chance of them playing it because if the big DJs are playing it, the labels are making money. But, you know, by you going out and DJing, maybe opening for some of these artists, going out to festivals and maybe meeting them on a night off, right? And you getting their emails and creating these relationships, you can do that without the help of the label. So um, I, I'm, I'm really loving how a lot of the releases here, uh, you know, when the Academy first started, mo- most guys are like, oh, I want to be on a label. And I think now not many of us are looking for a label right now because we can do all of the work ourselves, you know? Um, and I think that's the beauty of what's happening now is that you don't need to be confined to that label. And we're going to see a shift in the music industry and what happens with labels, I think, soon because, uh, you know, you could blow up overnight without having a label. And I think that's the beauty of, of like, kind of the internet also is that you're able to do all this. Yeah, and I think with TikTok and with how quickly things move, it's important to get your music out into the world. And I think that's one of the advantages of, you know, we finished the track, we put it out three weeks later, like that's it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and then the the other thing that we also talked about is like the time, the lifespan it has, right? It's like two yeah. weeks. It's like the week you put it out, like from the Monday to the Friday, the the week you hype it up, you get that's like your first week. You hype it, hype it, hype it. Then you have the following week where you post about it. And then after that, people are on to the next thing already. So it's like, how can you increase the longevity of a record? If you have a dance record that lasts more than two weeks, then you've done a pretty good job. But other than that, there's so much music that comes out that again, it just you you got it you gotta do something to make the life of it longer. And I think that's where TikTok is really, really good at because you can increase the lifespan of the record by, you know. A month or two months or whatever it may be. So, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that point. All right, I think this is a good point to wrap. Um, let's promo Ferrari Production Academy. What do you got coming up? How can people work with you? How can they reach out to you? Yeah, well, uh, at Ferrari DJ on Instagram for the Academy at Ferrari Prod Academy. Um, we're rock and rolling, man. I mean, we just started up the house course. It's a six week house music course um, that's teaching guys how to make house music, just general house music stuff. Um, we have the most people sign up for that, which has been amazing. Uh, it just started last week due to the Vegas nightmare, but, uh, we're rocking and rolling on that. We also have, you know, the beginner course that guys could take as a pre-recorded course, uh, that gets you started and talked about some of the things we did today, whether it was music business, scaffolding, music theory. If you just want to kind of just dive into it, um, you could, that course is always still available. And yeah, we just launched our, uh, I'm so excited about this. We launched our subscriptions for the Prior Production Academy too. So I'm going to be opening up the discord finally. Um, so if you do want to get one-on-one lessons or whatever, and you don't want to do a course or be a full-time student, you can now subscribe to the Pro Art Production Academy and get access to that schedule before anyone that doesn't subscribe to it. So I'm really excited about that. So keep an eye out for that. Discord will be opening. And yeah, we're just trying to one step at a time, one day at a time, keep growing this thing. So <laughs> I think the Discord and guys, if you if you guys don't know Parari or you know you're you're just getting started, I think the Discord is a great first step because you get access to everybody that's there and the resources that are there and you kind of see the community that Mikey's built. And that's, that's a big part of this, right? Like creating these communities and having places where you can go and share music and ask questions. And it's, it's a really important part of the process. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at what get down has done for the community. I mean, there, if I had a get down when I was coming up, like, I don't know what I would do, man. Like I would, I would, I would be over the, the mountains with like excitement because I didn't have that. It was, yeah. it was kind of every man for themselves and, Here's the, we talked about the unwritten rule book, but you know, here it is and good luck, you know? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, what you got, I, I always say what you guys are doing for everyone is just absolutely amazing. And I see more DJs popping up and playing venues that, you know, in Hoboken that, you know, was once maybe their dreams, which is crazy to think about. And, uh, they're, they're doing the thing. So kudos to you guys. It's good. It's an ever, uh, evolving, growing thing. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, all right, little housekeeping before we finish up here. First and foremost, Digital Music Pool. If you guys have never tried Digital Music Pool, you can try it for $9.99 for your first month. Uh, all the exclusive artists, myself, Angelo, the kid, Chumpian, there's a hundred, it's growing every week. Shout to Sellout MC. He's the newest exclusive artist on DMP. I think we're up to like eight, nine, ten exclusive artists at this yeah, point. Shout out to the Australia guys, killing it. Yeah, the Aussies are killing it, man. <laughs> Love it. Um, so that's the first thing. If you want to check out DMP, you can go to the show notes or go to my IG profile and 
sign up for DMP. Uh, the next thing, we are partnered with Birch, which is a venue in Hoboken. We're partnered with uh, you know, a company out of New York City, and we're doing a boat party. It's next Wednesday, July 12th. Uh, Cream, UFOso, uh, Nick Scalisi, tons of, tons of DJs, tons of artists on that boat. Uh, if you want to go check that out, again, check the show notes or IG. And what else? Closer. If you guys want to go check out my track, Go check it out. Stream, Stream it, it on Spotify. Download it. Get yeah. those streams up. Get those streams <laughs> up is right. Go to Spotify to listen to the track, please. <laughs> Should we plug the uh, the Disco Fries networking event too? That's the Wednesday as well. Yes. Also next Wednesday, we have the Disco Fries uh, album release party and networking event. Uh, if you're interested in checking that out, shoot me a DM and we could talk about it. I don't know if it's necessarily open, open to the public. Um, Huh. I haven't talked to those guys in a couple weeks. Yeah, shoot me a DM about it too. I know we're sponsors of it, so that would be yep. a good question to ask us. But yeah, any anyone that's a producer or you know trying to um, you know open up their brand to like other artists and stuff, that would be a good one to go to as well. A lot of big label execs and stuff will be there as well. So yeah, I, I'm excited for that event. It's going to be big gonna week, be good. big week big, coming up. Big week, <laughs> big week. A lot of coffee. <laughs> I'm actually, actually, I'm on vacation next week, so I'm taking, a, my girl's going to kill me, but I'm taking that night to go do what I got to do oh, on, man. The, on Wednesday. <laughs> well, it was better than being stuck in Vegas for six days and paying $50 for eggs and toast every morning, so. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for listening to this episode. Parari, thanks for jumping on as the co-host today. I'm yeah, excited about this. So I get the soundboard. Gary? Wherever you are in the world, we got to get the soundboard going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. Peace.